Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for the kind words of welcome. Thank you also from my side to UNESCO and the MSP Global team for hosting this session and for inviting Germany to present MSP in, in Germany. Next slide, please. Um, we've been asked to talk to some of the topics that you see listed here on, on the slide. So we'll be going through some of the basic background um, structures really that enable MSP in Germany. We'll be taking a look at stakeholder engagement and how a plan actually comes into being in Germany, where we benefit from the situation that we are in the middle of um, this process at the moment, as um, we've already heard in the introduction. Um, before touching briefly upon implementation of the plan and then because it's very important for Germany um, coming to planning in a transboundary or a cross-border context, which happens in the Baltic Sea and in the North Sea in our case. And then um, we'll touch upon evaluation and adaptation as a last um, section. And that is then where I'm going to hand over to Holger because um, Holger represents Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, um, a federal state in Germany with long years of experience of MSP and there the evaluation theme is one that is very current and very topical. Next slide please. So MSP has become a real success story really one can say since round about 2000. I believe it's now 70-ish countries that are engaged in an MSP initiative overall and when we look at this map in particular you'll see that the color is um, taken has taken over most of the world already and there's very few white spots actually left on this particular map. Next slide please. Zooming into the European context, you'll know that um, MSP in Europe received a push with the publication of the MSP directive, the EU directive, which was adopted in 2014. And this year actually is a very important year for MSP in Europe because we have a deadline because um, by 2021, all countries with the seacoast should now have um, established their maritime spatial plans. So that is also why many European countries are now pushing for final MSP plans in order to meet that deadline. You also see already that Germany is somewhere in the middle um, of Europe um, and you'll see also that um, within Europe the regional sea contexts are really pretty important. Next slide please. So zooming in even further, we now see Germany specifically, um, which is bordering the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And you can see here on the map some of the sizes and get an impression on just how big our maritime space really is. You'll see that um, the North Sea EEZ is really the biggest chunk that Germany is responsible for from the perspective of MSP. And you can see also already that there are different responsibilities and different, um, you know, again, sizes that different authorities are responsible for. So different parts of uh, German waters fall within different authorities. Next slide, please. So here we have um, the responsibilities listed and you'll see for the EEZ um, responsibility falls um, to my authority, the BSH, the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency, which comes under the Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community. And that's the two um, sort of, well, I can't really describe it anyway. You can see the EEZ um, in the North Sea context, the large part, including that odd little shape um, towards the Northwest, which we call the Ducks Beak, and then a fairly small chunk of the Baltic Sea, um, just on top of Mecklenburg or Vorpommern. And then you see the different responsibilities in territorial waters. We have Lower Saxony on the um, westernmost uh, side of Germany. Then we have Schleswig-Holstein, which also has a North Sea and the Baltic Sea part to consider, and Mecklenburg-Vorpommern is in the Baltic Sea responsible for the territorial sea there. Next slide, please. It's important to us to emphasize that even though MSP is clearly a national or a yeah, um, 
subnational endeavor, it doesn't occur in isolation. And the German case illustrates that very nicely because we are embedded in the Baltic Sea context that you see shown here on this map. You see the many countries that have to come together to manage the Baltic Sea. And the same applies to the North Sea context where you see just as many um, adjoining responsibilities and planning areas in the sea. Um, all of that has to be aligned, it has to be managed, and it's also actually part of the MSP directive in Europe. So um, um, cooperation, coordination and um, coherence are very important topics for us in Germany as well. Next slide, please. It's not going to come as a surprise when I tell you that German seas are pretty busy. So even before MSP came along, a lot was already going on. And it's always interesting when you explain that to people who may not be familiar with this fact, when you stand on the seashore and you look out and it looks empty, it just looks like a vast area with nothing, nothing much happening there, but that's not the case. German seas are amongst the busiest in the world, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, very important for things like maritime transport, for shipping, but also for energy generation increasingly. Um, there's lots of activities going on related to telecommunications, pipelines, um, there's defense going on, there's underwater heritage, and of course, it's a very important seas, or both seas, in fact, are very important for conservation uh, and for recreation um, as well. Next slide, please. So MSP in Germany happens really at the interface of lots of different existing regulations and agreements, uh, not least international agreements, but also at the national level, there's plenty of existing legislation, regulation, mostly on a sectoral basis. And I would assume that this is the case in many of, of your countries. It'll be a similar picture. We have um, sectoral regulations and rules for, for things like wind energy, for scientific use of the sea, um, for shipping, for um, raw material extraction, for example, um, also for leisure um, and not least uh, for national and collective defense, not to mention conservation, protection and improvement of the marine environment where there's maybe the, the greatest variety and the greatest layering of, of different uh, agreements, conventions and so on all coming together. So lots already that has to be dealt with in some way. And now MSP, of course, trying to somehow bring all these various interests together. Next slide. It's important to, to emphasize that Germany as a federal country already has to contend with these different um, responsibilities. Um, so each of the um, authorities, the MSP authorities, might take a slightly different approach to, to MSP. So if you are a, a federal state, for example, like Lower Saxony or Schleswig-Holstein, your perspective might be slightly different to the perspective of the BSH. And that's because um, you might have um, a perspective if that really comes from the landward part of the federal state and then goes out to the sea, whereas the BSH with responsibility, responsibility only for the EEZ might have a different perspective that looks more from the sea actually onto the land. It also means that there are slightly different timescales for the planning cycle, for the planning revision as well. We already heard that the last plan in mecklenburg vorpommern was completed or has been enforced since uh, 2016. Um, at the EEZ, we are just in the middle of a revision and the same actually goes for Lower Saxony and Schleswig-Holstein. And I'm emphasizing this because um, within Germany already, um, there is um, that need to achieve a certain coherence while also recognizing that federal states do have slightly different approaches, might have slightly different priorities, and might also have different ideas as to how they think this type of coherence should be achieved. Next slide, please. The next slide is just to show you an example really of um, a plan from a federal state. This one is the one that is also currently being revised and it shows you Schleswig-Holstein, which sits in between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, just to give you an idea that their plan in fact also covers the land 
uh, territory as well. So theirs is very much an integrated land and territorial waters development plan. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at the tools of the trade, the thing that enables marine spatial planning to, to happen in Germany, which is the Federal Spatial Planning Act. And that's a very important piece of legislation because it actually sets out the key tasks of spatial planning for the entire um, federal state. And it's interesting because it mentions as the key task sustainable spatial development, and it mentions reconciling the social and economic demands on space with its ecological functions. So it's actually a pretty holistic uh, approach um, already set out in the underpinning legislation. It then says that another important or the important task for marine spatial planning is to coordinate activities so that there is least conflict and to, where possible, resolve or mitigate uh, any conflicts that might occur, either between different activities or uses, and also to some degree between these uses and the environment. In the German context, it's also important that spatial plans are binding and that it is not just a plan in the form of a map, even though we'll be seeing some maps uh, shortly. Um, the German plan is very much also a text and a descriptive part, plus then the illustrating maps. And the plan that's important is obviously much more than zoning. It's, it's a more comprehensive, a different type of document. Next slide, please. Um, German planning has what's called um, objectives and principles, really, as the um, underpinning, I guess, regulatory instruments. So the objectives are really the binding requirements for the development, for the organization and safeguarding of space. So these are objectives that have been formulated at the level of the plan and um, it's a word in German that can't really be translated properly, but it means that there the, the matters and the interests have already been conclusively weighed up against one another by the spatial planning authority, meaning essentially that certain priority decisions have been made. And that commonly translates spatially, if we then think of maps, into priority areas where you have a certain use that's given priority and any other functions that are incompatible with that priority uh, use uh, are then excluded or severely restricted. The next thing is what we call the principles of spatial planning. There, there's a little bit more leeway um, it's not quite as conclusive, not quite as strict as the objectives. Um, the principles are more like guidelines for the development, organization and safeguarding of space. These are things that have to be considered in decision making and commonly translates into reservation areas where certain uses are still given a particular weight and um, but aren't necessarily given complete priority over other activities. Okay, so those are really the two levels, I guess, that uh, planning in Germany has. Next slide. So here's the current plan for the German EEZ, um, which is the 2009 plan. And you'll see that it has certain lines and squares on that map. Um, you'll see some, um, the blue lines uh, that relates to shipping, the red ones relate to offshore wind farming. You can't see it very well, probably, but it's just to illustrate um, that these are the activities or the uses that the current plan um, focuses on and regulates. But 2009 is quite a while ago, and there have been a number of changes, both in terms of how the seas are being used, but also in terms of the policy environment. Um, new policies have come into play, international guidelines have been developed, and we have learned many lessons also from international projects, from other countries' um, approaches to MSP plans. And that is why a revision of this particular plan has been ongoing since, I think it's two years now, more or less. Um, next slide, please. So we are right in the middle of um, this very process that I'm showing you here, the planning process. 
where you see depicted on the left hand side the planning um, steps per se, um, how things uh, develop from a kind of pre-planning assessment to all the way, you know, all the way to the end, which is an ordinance, um, paralleled by steps of participation and importantly also a strategic environmental assessment which runs in parallel and you can see the various stages so the initial stage will be a status report then planning options then it goes through two drafts before we come to the final document the final plan and you can see the corresponding steps illustrated in the two other columns in parallel next slide please this slide looks at it in a little bit more detail and there's actually a red arrow missing. It's um, to indicate where um, stakeholders actually come into play. It actually starts with the very first step already, um, the instigation of the planning process um, and you know, um, also thinking back to how the old plan perhaps has, has done its job. Has it been successful or not? Um, before it then gets to a stage where um, expert meetings and sector specific workshops take place. Um, then it moves on to more specific planning options, pre planning drafts that are being considered. The SEA process begins in parallel. Um, the first draft is then um, completed. And then there's consultation round. Then it goes back to the um, authority to redraft. Then another consultation round follows on. And then eventually the plan comes into force. And this is just to indicate where stakeholder engagement takes place. And you can see also that um, we consult with a pretty broad range of different stakeholders at all these stages, including primarily other statutory bodies, other authorities. Of course, also other sector representatives like industry. The federal states are pretty important stakeholders because of coherent issues, environmental NGOs, and also it's a process that is in fact open to the general public at the um, consultation rounds, the formal consultation rounds, and um, I can report that last time in last November when this took place, uh, we did have um, some people who listened in and also gave comments uh, during that round. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview just to give you an idea of, of the timing of these various stages. That's the current um, plan. So you can see it's not exactly a super quick process, but actually a pretty fast one as far as um, you know, a comprehensive integrated planning process is concerned. Um, you'll see also that um, we have something called a scientific advisory board, which is also being consulted um, throughout all these stages. And again, you can see that the idea was, we'll see whether we can make that deadline, the final plan should be ready by this summer. Um, and we hope very much that it'll then come in to force by September-ish, autumn 2021. Next slide. So how does um, this initial stage of considering, you know, planning options translate into the final product? So the first stage in our case was to start by looking at, well, okay, well, what are the maximum requirements? What would each sector actually ideally want to see? And to try and to yeah, depict that on individual maps, which just shown here in different colors. Then um, what happens is an overlay and actually looking at this overlay to see are there any conflicts? Is there anything obvious where we can already tell at this stage that there are going to be um, issues to be resolved? Are there any hotspots spatially where there's lots of interests, lots of different sectors maybe wanting to have um, access to particular sea areas? And from that, then in, in, in this planning um, process, we came up with three different plausible planning alternatives where different interests are given different weights. So in our case, one in this instance, we said, well, OK, if we actually gave priority to shipping, let's say, what would that look like um, if all the other interests would then you know, come second or third? What would happen if you gave energy um, priority? What would happen if you really maximize um, sea space for renewable energy, in our case, offshore wind, for example? What would that look like? 
And the third option, what if we gave priority to nature conservation and then made everything else kind of in a way, you know, second place after nature conservation? So three different options. Next slide, please. That we then discussed and uh, put forward and uh, debated in different technical discussions. So this is what then went into the um, sectoral and expert workshops that we saw in the previous slides, just to have a look at them, to see, you know, what do different sectors, different groups, different experts think. And from those meetings, from the comments, from the results of those discussions, a first draft was then produced. And it's not very surprising, of course, when I say that it kind of is a compromise between all these different options. So, um, of course, um, planning being an integrative tool tries to do justice to as many interests as possible. So you still see shipping there, you see offshore wind farming there, you see nature conservation interests in that first draft. Next slide, please. This is what it looked like. That was the draft that then went out to public consultation in November 2020. And you can see, I'm hoping you can read it OK. So blue is really for shipping. And you can see that there's priority areas um, that have been given to shipping. Red is offshore wind priority areas. Then we have green, anything to do with conservation. There's different uh, types of conservation areas, different um, reasons. Um, and then there's also some smaller blocks for things like raw material extraction. There's also a very small one, I don't know if you can spot it, for fishery and for scientific research. And a number of other things are not actually um, regulations per se, but are simply included in the plan for information purposes. And that uh, basically um, means the military training areas and also some, some fixed infrastructure in the Baltic Sea. Next slide, please. This is just an overview of the various topics that the new um, MSP plan covers. And you can see it's actually quite a list. Uh, it also contains some new ones compared to the 2009 plan, for example, on the water cultural heritage, which we didn't have in the previous one. Next slide, please. The plan also contains what's called sort of general requirements. And those are requirements that apply to any economic use in the sea. So that doesn't really matter whether it's in a priority area or, or not. These are really objectives and principles that apply throughout and throughout the entire planning area and to all of the sectors, everything that is using that space. And you'll see that these are pretty generic sort of overarching principles, I guess, such as obviously, ideally, one would hope that economic uses are going to be sustainable in the sea and they should be as space saving as possible as well. Then there's one which speaks to fixed installations, especially um, offshore wind farms, for example, where the um, objective is that after they come to the end of their use, they are to be dismantled. Another principle is speaking really to the conflict theme that economic uses should not really interfere with each other any more than strictly necessary. Then there's an environmental one, which is also very important, saying that threats to marine environment or any adverse impacts on the functions of the ecosystem are to be avoided and best environmental practice is to be taken into account. These are summaries, by the way, these are examples, they are slightly longer in the original text, just to give you a flavor really of, of what these are. And the last one is a monitoring requirement to, to make sure that um, impacts on the marine environment really are as minimal as possible um, and are to be evaluated at some point as well. Next slide, please. So in addition to these general principles, how do we actually then end up with spatial designations for use? And I'm going to use shipping as an example to show you how that works. Next slide, please. 
This is a picture that looks like beautiful, colorful drawing, really an abstract drawing, but is in fact AIS data um, on ships using the North Sea in various shipping routes. And you can see from that data, this is really individual ships um, that have been tracked, showing you which routes they commonly take. And it's interesting to see that even though the freedom of ship or freedom of navigation says ships can really go anywhere in the sea, they do stick to certain routes. And as you can see, some of these are extremely busy and are actually quite nicely bundled already as well. So this is really some of the information that then goes into, next slide please, into the draft plan, which then uses that data to come up with a proposal for shipping lanes for more specific designations. Ah, oh, sorry, that's the slide for the Baltic Sea, the same idea to show intensity of shipping traffic really um, along the Baltic Sea coast in that case and around the neighboring countries. You see Denmark at the top, Sweden, and then further east going into the Baltic proper. Next slide. So this is the kind of data that's really, really crucial for planning to, to happen. And then translated in our case into exactly this um, slide, which now emphasizes the shipping um, designations, the priority areas that are given over to shipping based on the information that we have um, from the AIS data. So the blue lines you can see are priority areas for shipping, which really basically means that these are areas that are kept free of any other potentially competing um, activities, enabling shipping to, to really take place without interruption. Next slide. So this is really what, what happens for all the, oh, sorry, and, and the objectives and principles, just to um, complete that section um, in priority, in priority areas for shipping, you can see that um, other um, activities um, are taking, taking sep second place. Um, so shipping has the clear priority because of on class. There's also, you might have noticed a slightly lighter blue colored um, area, which is a temporary shipping priority area, which is there until 2035, after which it kind of um, becomes a slightly less important area, a reservation area. Um, well, we'll have to see exactly how things develop with, with shipping in that area. And then there's another um, objective which says um, pollution of the marine environment by shipping is also to be reduced. So it's not just about the um, um, spatial arrangements, but also about the quality or about rather about how um, shipping actually makes use of the sea um, in line with some of the earlier general objectives and principles. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the kinds of descriptions, sorry, just to finish on that one, that really goes with the maps um, and explains really also the reasoning why certain things are permitted or perhaps are not uh, allowed in certain zones. So yes, the same um, happens for um, all the other uses, other evidence comes into play as a basis for planning. So here is the example of existing licenses for sand extraction, for gravel extraction. There's also oil and gas extraction. So that is information that's collected from other authorities, also from research institutes. Next slide, please. It's all brought together. This one here is the example from offshore wind farming. That's in fact the current site development plan for offshore wind 2020, also very recent, the sector plan if you want. So that's all important background information that um, then has to be brought together, has to be considered in order to come up with a comprehensive draft plan. Next slide. Just as another example, offshore wind, because it's very important, um, I've given you an overview of just how large these areas are because of the strong political um, support for offshore wind, for renewable energies generally. There are targets that have to be achieved and the, the areas um, allow us to um, hopefully generate a certain amount of um, renewable energy. You can see that that's quite a lot of gigawatts that have to be produced. So those are the red areas um, that are in the current draft plan. Next slide. Sorry, that's the Baltic. We can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> 
And again, we have um, supporting objectives and principles for offshore wind. Uh, we've seen the priority areas, we've seen the reservation areas. Um, there are considerations that come into play of existing and planned power cables. Certain safety distances have to be taken into account. Within um, priority and reservation areas, certain access rules for fisheries um, also come into play. Um, there's allowances for naval defense and also for military installations. And there are objectives or principles also that speak to uh, construction noise, to operational noise, making sure that um, the impact on the environment is kept as minimal as possible. Next slide. Let me briefly come to implementation of uh, the plan. Now, the Marine Spatial Plan for the EZ is um, a plan that addresses other public and decision-making authorities. It's not really so much for the general public. It's really for anyone else who, who actually has um, decision-making powers within the sea. So sectoral decisions that are made now need to be in line with the provisions made by this plan. And that applies, for example, to the Federal Mining Agency, they give out licenses, but also to the BSH itself, which is also the authority responsible for, the, um, for um, offshore wind farming approvals. Um, at the same time, there are also limits to what the Marine Spatial Plan can regulate. And these are uh, key topics uh, listed here, for example, fisheries. Um, MSP planning in Germany does not have a remit to regulate fisheries because that is in the hands of the European Union. It's the, a matter of the common fisheries policy. The same goes for shipping. This is um, international law, it's UNCLOS that's responsible here. And then, of course, a national plan also cannot really regulate for any international uses or impacts or any activities that might affect Germany's sea areas from the neighboring countries. Even though, of course, the idea would be to try and minimize that kind of thing by just talking to one another and achieving coherence with their plans as well. Next slide. And that brings me quite nicely to the planning in the transboundary context in Germany. Um, the MSP directive, as already mentioned, has a strong focus on coherence of uh, maritime spatial plans, which means really looking at transnational issues. And that really translates into a rather strong need for coordination in the regional seas context. This picture here is the North Sea. You can see those shipping lanes um, obviously continue on into Denmark, into the Netherlands, into the UK, into Norway. And the same, of course, also applies to any environmental concerns, also offshore wind farms. There's lots going on in all the neighboring countries. Next slide. I think the next one is the same for the Baltic, if I'm not wrong. Exactly. So that, that's the picture for the Baltic Sea. So you can see very tightly packed, um, lots of um, different things that have to be coordinated. So it's very important uh, for Germany to be aware of that and to be mindful of the regional seas context. Next slide. So coordination of the spatial plans with the neighboring planning areas, that's one thing. And the, uh, an obvious example would be, for example, if you're planning an offshore wind farm, um, and your neighboring country has um, a port perhaps in the vicinity and wants to make sure that their port remains accessible to large ships, it might be a good idea to talk to one another to make sure that the offshore wind farm does not impede that kind of access uh, to a major port. But there's also a wider um, issue involved here. It's really also about just talking to one another. It's about collaboration up and above um, perhaps also the specific um, spatial development plans. It's really about learning from one another, developing MSP together within regional seas contexts, um, which in the German case, because it's a federal country, also applies to within Germany because we have four authorities. So that same exchange, that same collaboration also applies within our own state. And then obviously internationally in the Baltic Sea and in the North Sea. Next slide. 
And in the international context, we've been very fortunate that we've had great support from the European Union um, in various projects. And you can see they go back a long way, even further, I believe, than um, to 2005, the first one, in fact, took place. So a string of international projects where we had the opportunity to, to um, learn together, really, how to do MSP and to develop also um, shared approaches, um, common, yeah, common approaches um, and also to develop the topics that are important um, within these different projects. And you can see the Baltic has been a bit of a forerunner, but the North Sea has also caught up quite nicely over the last um, few years. Next slide. So the advantage of, of all these um, projects and um, international approach really is that it's much easier that way to, to deal with international activities uh, jointly and shipping is just one obvious example. There's linear infrastructure also of another nature, pipelines, telecommunications. There's also the impacts of large scale uses, like if Germany now is really building big offshore wind farms on a fairly large scale, what's the impact this might have on neighboring planning areas and vice versa. Uh, it's a, a possibility, it's an opportunity to discuss cumulative impacts, um, you know, how much um, of an impact um, can we see once we take it all together. Um, what happens with migratory species, for example? Birds are a good example, but also mammals, marine mammals that are very mo mobile and um, clearly where um, in an international approach is required. And then also when it comes to things like, what do we mean by the ecosystem approach really? Um, what tools do we use to actually assess any impacts? What about things like climate change? How are we gonna tackle this? And what about the long-term visions? What about long-term development um, interests and ideas also for the regional seas? Um, how can we perhaps um, come together on all of those? Next slide. And it helps also that um, in both the North Sea and the Baltic Sea context, there are some established institutions like Helcom and VASAP, but also that there's now, because of these many projects, a fairly good sense of familiarity, there's trust, we all know each other quite well by now. And of course, it also helps that uh, some of the issues do tend to be quite similar across the borders. So we've been fortunate really that we have been able to develop a fairly pragmatic technical approach to transboundary cooperation and to actually also engage in MSP, even though at the political level, maybe there are um, issues that are not quite as straightforward. And one example is that the borders are not actually entirely clear between uh, Germany and some of its neighboring countries. So these have been some very important enablers I'd really like to emphasize at this point. Next slide, please. That's my last slide, actually, before I hand on to Holger, um, on evaluation. Evaluation is something that has happened for the EEZ plan in the form of a status report. So before the revision started, a report was drawn up that did look at whether the 2009 plan had achieved its objective, whether it has actually had a guiding function as intended. Um, but we do think that as far as the EZ is concerned, we probably still are in the fairly early stages of learning how to do evaluation. So um, it is something that is certain to develop, even though we've already got quite a good sense of, um, okay, the kind of monitoring data that's available. Um, there are specialized information networks we can draw on already, but there's certainly a need to develop a little bit more of an idea, perhaps on what kind of um, indicators we might be able to use, what kind of standards perhaps we also want to use. So how we are really thinking of evaluating um, maritime spatial planning in the future, um, looking towards also again the coherence aspect and how we might be able to do this um, um, together with our um, international friends and partners. But this is actually where I'd like to hand over to Holger because Holger can report a little bit more on what mecklenburg vorpommern has already done in terms of evaluation of uh, a marine spatial plan. Holger. Yeah, the warm welcome also from my side. Thanks to Kira, thanks to our hosts 
Um, I would like to share a few brief um, insights from, from my region, which is Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, or sometimes also called Mecklenburg-Western Pomerania. Next slide, please. Uh, it was mentioned already, but a brief reminder, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern is one of the, the federal states, one of the lender, as we call them in German. So it's um, say a sub-regional sub state, but in terms of MSP, we are not subordinate to the federal level. Um, a fun fact might be that actually we're treating each other as like, like neighbors. Uh, so whether in my planning process, whether I involve BSH as our federal agency or whether I involve Poland is roughly said pretty much the same. There's a different legal background somehow uh, but in the process and in, in the outcome, um, it's, it's more or less the same procedure. Next slide, please. Yeah, as mentioned, our very first MSP plan, or actually our state development program that had, or the first state development program that had a chapter on MSP, came into force in 2005, and you can see here detail just showing the, the marine part of that, the plan. As you can see, there's much blue space, or you could also say white spots actually left, um, you can also see by that that we were a bit reluctant. We were quite early beginners in the Baltic Sea region, but we were also early learners. So we were careful with making too many stipulations and you can see that on the next slide, please. This has changed when we made the amendment in 2016. Next slide. You see now our waters, if you, if you look at them on the map, at least on our MSP map, are much more crowded. There's hardly any space left where we do not have a place specific designation on it. Um, and on the way from getting from the 2005 plan to the 2016 plan, we tried to make a sound evaluation to have a, a good basis for this amendment. Next slide, please. Nowadays, there is uh, good literature on evaluation in MSP, and one of this literature comes from UNESCO IOC. There's a guide on evaluating marine spatial plans. Um, the, the figure on the right here is taken from the plan. When we started in 2006 to, to make our own concept, there was not so much literature on that. Um, Nonetheless, as you can see, the, the figure from that UNESCO IOC guide is founded on, on classical management literature, actually, or theory. The, the circle that you can see in the left part of that slide here comes from literature on, on management theory, in that case here on human resources management, performance management, and this is pretty much the same. And we also use that, that basis to develop our own evaluation concept. Next slide, please. Um, maybe Alejandro, could you click through the next steps? Yeah, there should be four elements and one more. Perfect, thank you. So on the basis of that, that old state development program, uh, we started already in the next year, in 2006, then to make a, a good concept, as I said. Um, that was a lot of work, actually. And at the end of the day, we ended up with long table sheets full of indicators where we tried to measure whether we were well performing. Um, this process was a process over many years. As I said, we started with the concept in 2006 and then over the next years, we tried to, to check whether we were actually achieving our goals. Next slide, please. 
questions that we tried to address were, were those here. The, the first one was, how do the different aspects do not have the same statistical foundation as on land. Within Europe, there is a pretty good system on spatial temporal statistics called NATS. So for, for every space in Europe, we have on different size classes data, how things develop. I do know in which municipality the population is developing in which direction within different age classes. I do know the number of jobs over different years. I do know um, how the ecological situation is developing, but I do not have that data in the same quality on, on the sea. There is data, of course, on marine and maritime issues, but it's, it's not made for spatial planning, actually. And the spatial component is pretty often missing or it's based on a very coarse grid or structure so that it's not really telling a good story to me as a spatial planner. Another issue is that MSP is just one of many governance mechanisms and Kira just has shown that in most cases we have some competence but not within all fields so there are different mechanisms that steer the development of the seas. Um, and not all of them are governance mechanisms, of course, there are also other drivers. But even within those governance mechanisms, it's hard to trace back whether this was a success of MSP or of another policy. The third issue is that very often the effects of how we are using the seas are actually taking place on land. So I do need to combine the statistics from the marine um, part with the land statistics. In our case, we were partly able to do that because as a coastal state, we, are, we do have responsibility for both parts, our own territory on land, plus the territory within the uh, 12 nautical miles zone. But we also discovered that very often the effects of marine uses go far into the hinterland. So it might well be that a use that is taking place within the Baltic Sea actually has an effect on Switzerland or on Bavaria. And then I, I do again get difficulties of how to measure that. Then, of course, there are interdependencies of effects, so it's not always easy to, to make a good distinction between them. <laughs> is this an effect of climate change, or is that an effect of fisheries? Um, you need to be careful, and this is a bit methodological problem to, to make a good distinction here. And then, two more issues. The, among those tasks that MSP has, one is that we, we are obliged to induce long-term developments. And long-term developments means that I might, might not be able to see whether my, my MSP really has an effect within the next five years, because my core ambition might actually be to, to make a change within the next decade or two decades my processes might be pretty slow, even if I'm now trying to find a, a spot for an offshore wind farm, then the licensing procedure might go on after I'm finished, and that might take another five or ten years, probably. Um, so the, the time scale is an issue. You need to be careful when to measure. Um, and another task that we need to fulfill is that we are obliged to correct contradictory special strategic policies. And it's really tricky to, to measure whether you're successful in balancing, for example, 
climate change issues with human well-being or nature conservation with shipping um, and the role of MSP in doing that. Next slide, please. So for, for our next monitoring attempt that we are looking forward now, uh, I guess we will be a bit more hands-on. And um, my, my personal opinion is that we will focus on steering effects. And here I have to add that one supporting situation that, that we have in, in our case is that we are always involved also in the implementation and licensing procedures. So we get direct and constant feedback, everyday feedback on whether our stipulations actually work. We will also or should focus, of course, on how the world is evolving. So how has society and societal requirements, how did they change? And what, of course, happens within sectorial planning will also be important to us. But you can see already from that list that um, I'm a bit reluctant to go back to these long table sheets with indicators. Next slide, please. So if we um, go back to that figure that I showed earlier from the UNESCO IOC guide, uh, we'll see there's a lot of good things in that guide. And um, one, one element that um, this guide builds on is that you need to collect your experience from the implementation phase. Uh, I would say that to me, this is in, in our case here, the most valuable information that, that I get on a daily basis. Next click, please. Then we get constant feedback by stakeholders and we are in, in daily contact to, uh, not to everyone of course, but um, this is quite important also to, to see how society is changing how your core partners in marine management are working with your own plan. This is also quite helpful to me. Next click, please. Then I mentioned this earlier, how is the world evolving? This is quite important. And also this is a valuable advice from this UNESCO IOC guide. Next click, please. I'm also a big friend of applied research and Kira just has shown the long list of um, mainly European funded projects that BSH is engaged in and I also have the feeling that these kind of projects, they are quite helpful um, and you might add some, some own from your own funding on top. Next click please. But where I'm not really convinced is the idea of evaluating performance, which means that evaluating whether your plan, whether my plan is a success or a failure. Um, I mentioned those issues and my personal feeling is that we are not really able to measure that. Plus, I have the feeling that it's not really helpful for for making the, the next steps and improving your plan with the next amendment. The information that you get from these other pillars is, is quite helpful and to me this is fully sufficient. So I'm, I'm doubtful whether performance evaluation in its core is really possible on our today's statistical basis. But I also have the feeling that it's not really needed. Next click please. My, my last remark is a bit on, on the need. So what, what we learned from, from our experience is that more or less the day after our plans came into force, there was also um, a new world somehow. So this is always movement and evolvement. And um, you can see here that quite soon after our plan was finished and published and came into force, we also had to observe that stakeholders' opinions started to change in some details first, but in some cases also the opinion of core stakeholders that play a role in implementing our plan. People approached us 
uh, last year with new ideas for new uses that are not covered within our plan. And in that case, for example, an underwater laboratory on a larger scale. And of course, there's always coming new data, new knowledge, and other things that you need to to adapt somehow and, and to integrate into your plan. None of these single developments is really, uh, I would say, the, the core trigger to, to make an amendment. In most cases, this is simply how it is. Things are, are making progress. And uh, we also have flexibility mechanisms to deal with these little changes. But the signals, the more indicators you get that, well, your, your plan is getting old somehow. They, of course, then this is um, more and more a signal that there's a need for making an amendment. And the best way to get prepared for that amendment is, of course, evaluation looking for things that I mentioned earlier, how is the world evolving, what are others doing, why do I stand in relation to that. 